Anything else, Sam, before we go on to our speakers and... Okay, so we're, we're all going to be on mute because we've lots and lots to cover this morning. Um, but I'm going to pass you over now to Alicia, who's going to start by telling you about the CLD guidance from a Scottish Government perspective. Thanks very much, Colette. Thanks very much for inviting me along today to give the overview of the CLD guidance. So just a, a little bit of background about the CLD guidance. The CLD guidance was developed and continues to be updated. It was developed back early July and continues to be updated with stakeholders from across the CLD sector. It's gone through a rigorous process of approval and input, which involved Scottish Government Legal Department, Health Protection Scotland, Health and Safety Executive, Scottish Government Policy College, Trade Unions, COSLA, and a whole range of other um, inputs before it finally being signed off by Scottish Ministers. So the purpose of the guidance is it's supposed to empower service providers at a local level and practitioners to make really important decisions in their own local context. The primary objective in producing the CLD guidance is to reduce the rate of transmission within communities. And I can't stress that strongly enough. The guidance is not about what we do and the value placed in what we do. We all know that's incredibly valuable. It's about how we do it. So what we did was, with that in mind, um, we felt it was also really, really important, excuse me, <clears throat> we felt it was also really, really important to put in some elements of CLD practice to let other people understand the impacts that are made by helping vulnerable people. So the guidance is set out in a way that lets everyone involved in CLD know what their responsibilities are in relation to keeping staff, volunteers and learners as safe as possible when they're trying to start and restart services. The guidance should always be used in conjunction with other sets of guidance. So it's a very broad overview. The CLD sector is really, really wide and means a lot of different things to a lot of different people in a lot of different contexts. Um, so that guidance should always be used in conjunction with other sets of guidance for maybe unregulated children's services, community centres reopening, existing guidance for colleges, schools, local authorities. There's a whole lot of guidance in there. I think when I was developing this, it was something like 8,500 pieces of guidance. So it's a lot of guidance to navigate if you don't know where to go. And I'll cover that a wee bit um, later on. There's also guidance that's been developed by SEDC, um, which is a much more practical support to communities. So there's, divide, there's guidance being developed in a practical sense for each of the different sectors of CLD. There's one for youth work, SEDC have provided guidance way back, I think, early May, and also um, adult learning is currently developing guidance for the adult learning sector, all with very different um, service provisions. So the guidance should be used in conjunction with coronavirus regulations, the Scottish Government strategic framework, which came into force on the 2nd of November, to help you and make you fully recognise um, your responsibilities when delivering services for communities. Guidance is designed to help practitioners and service providers to actually think about the services they're providing but also about the impact on service users, their families, and on the wider community. And the first thing I, I would say about it is about the provision of service is a cautious approach is always, always required in relation to the virus. Um, what I've been saying to other services for adult learning and for youth work is that just because you can start services and feel you're in a position to start services doesn't necessarily mean that you should start services. So again, the guidance isn't a replacement for the decisions that have to be taken at a local level in the best interests of young people, adults, communities and their families. It's about helping you to do a few things. So firstly, it's about helping you to consider the learning environment or the community environment or the engagement environment and the mitigations that can be put in place to allow things to be 
resumed and started safely. It's about helping you to be honest with yourself and be honest with other people about how the spread of the virus and the mitigations in place affect services and service users. And it's about helping you to understand whether the behaviours of service users will affect the mitigations that have been in place. And what do I mean by that? I think one example is, will the people involved or the activities have an impact on other people or other services within the premises that you're using? Will the people involved be able to understand the rules that are being implemented? And are they likely to adhere to the rules? The guidance is a, a really good, it's, it's very in-depth and it gives a lot of information, but it's actually worth sort of working through it. Um, it's designed from a sort of health and safety perspective to help you to adequately risk assess the risks that, that are there. They present themselves every day to everyone involved. And some of the steps that you should consider in completing a suitable and sufficient risk assessment for carrying out the services. So it's about knowing your service and the working environment and assessing the impact of the work you do and the importance of the activity. So whilst recognising the social need for people to access services, the guidance has been developed with stakeholders and measured to strike a balance between keeping people safe and avoiding the harms that are presented to people within communities through the transmission of COVID-19. So for example, I myself run a community group for young people and it, it's great, it's vibrant, it's lovely to see young people together. The young people love it, I love seeing them. However, re restarting that service came with a lot of risks. The young people are vulnerable. One of them recently had a transplant. Um, so we as a group have therefore taken the decision not to restart for the time being purely because the young people can still engage online. And if they were to get together, the person who can't be, the person who is vulnerable, or a couple of people who are really vulnerable, can't take part in the activities and that would exclude them. So this way, everybody can still be involved and everybody can be safe. So the most important message I can give you today is if you're not sure, stop. Make sure mitigations and risk assessments are in place and understood by everybody involved. And if in doubt, ask for help from local health protection teams and environmental health professionals. This is particularly important to volunteers who lead services and supporting those volunteers to run the services that are really, really important within communities. And I think finally, to put all of this into context, Jason Leach is so much better at putting this into context than I am at one of the SCBO presentations um, that I did a while ago. And someone asked a question, and the key question to ask yourself is, if someone in a particular environment was carrying COVID-19 and potentially spreading that disease among other people within the environment, can you put your hand on your heart and say, that service had to take place, it's essential, and it had to take place in the way that it did. So is it really worth the risk is what I'm asking you. Sorry, what I'm asking you to ask yourself. So we've updated the guidance quite recently um, following the strategic framework being implemented and our plea is just for everyone to operate within the spirit of the regulations. Keep, keep everyone round about you safe and encourage everyone to keep each other safe. The CLD sector guidance is in a good position. The stakeholders were able to bring a lot of insight into the development of it before it was published, but nevertheless, it's important to remember the purpose of the guidance is about keeping people safe and stopping transmission of the virus. It's about how we do things, not what we do. So at the moment, as I've said, there's a couple of additional pieces of guidance in Train Learning Link Scotland are developing guidance specifically for the adult learning sector. And we are working with the CLD policy team are working with colleagues across government to help with guidance for community centres strengthened some of the language in the guidance recently to reflect that in levels three and four, services should be for the essential purposes of education and training and the avoidance of harm or the prevention of harm. Um, this is really relevant at the moment with 11 council areas moving into level four. 
And again, can't stress strongly enough, a cautious approach to service delivery is always required. Um, share your practices with, with each other. Develop responses together so that everybody understands what the expectation is on each other. And in summary, I think I would like to reiterate what Dr. Harden outlined at the webinar on Friday, to take all the precautions possible to make sure people around you are adhering to risk assessments, keeping each other safe. There should be less activity as each level, so each as each protection level rises within your local authority area. There should be less activity taking place. And at level four, there should be no social activity taking place. It should be for essential purposes. Make sure everyone washes their hands regularly, wears face coverings indoors, and keeps two metres apart. Thanks very much for your time. I'll pass you back to Colin. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Alicia. That was really informative. Um, we're now going to go on to do some of the question and answer section. So instead of keeping all of the questions that you submitted when you registered to the end for a panel session, we've actually incorporated the questions within the, the body. So we're, we're going to be answering the questions as we go along. So generally speaking, the questions that you submitted fall into different categories. And what we're going to do now is we're going to answer the questions that really relate to interpreting the guidance and compliance and operational advice and support. So we're really going to try and follow on from what Alicia has just said there. And I'm going to read out some of the questions and I'm going to ask Alicia and Lisa from Health Scotland to, to come in and answer some of these questions. So what services can be provided or permitted? What advice can you offer to organisations who can't find clarity because their body of work fails under multiple guidance? Some of the third sector groups that I support are not sticking to all COVID restrictions and are still looking for support from me. Where do I start? CLD professionals in these situations. What are the guidelines regarding community group meetings in their own venues for meetings, training and development? And is there guidance on reopening of community halls? So Alicia, do you want to come in first and then Lisa, please? <coughs> sure, thanks very much for that. Um, so what services can be provided or permitted? Uh, I think I outlined some of that in my input just there. Um, I, I, as a Scottish Government Policy Officer, can't say, well, you can start and you can't start and you can do this and you can do that. There, there are so many decisions that have to be taken at a local level that really our position is to try and help you and provide some guidance to allow you to decide which services are essential because they will be different for different communities. I would say, again, can't say it strongly enough, as each of the protection levels rises and we start getting into those levels three and four, services should be for the purposes of the prevention of harm. So stopping people who are really vulnerable facing further disadvantage through the pandemic is how I would be approaching that one. I don't know if Lisa wants to maybe add anything after that. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, yeah, just really to echo um, the points that you've made, maybe just a couple of things. I mean, I think we all probably appreciate that there is a lot of guidance around. There's the CLD guidance, there's other guidance that, that relates to community organisations and groups around workplace settings, the general uh, health and safety implications and so on. So there is a lot out there and we do, we do know that it can be difficult, particularly for some of the smaller organisations and like the kind of local, more informal networks to, to find themselves in it. And I think that's one of the things that we've tried to do with the Support and Community Safely resource. And, and, and we're going to speak about that a, a little bit later on. But just in broad terms, um, yeah, definitely the CLD guidance um, and the, the local protection levels guidance. 
do give uh, an overview of what is and isn't permitted in each of the tiers. And probably just what I would say is, is that if you're looking at that and you don't see your particular service or activity, what you might find is, is that it does make reference to other types of activities and services that whilst they're not, they're not exactly your service, that you could use that as a point of reference. So for example, it does talk about community centres in the local protection levels guidance, and it does talk about the types of things that would be permitted in the different tiers. So for example, in tier four, as Alicia mentioned, it talks about essential services only, and it gives a few examples there about what it might um, consider to be essential services, and that is things like you know, delivering an emergency aid response, crisis intervention services, um, services that are um, about protecting vulnerable people from harm, as Alicia just mentioned. So, um, so whilst you're absolutely right, the sector is absolutely huge and there isn't bespoke guidance for every particular part of it, but generally speaking, if you look at the guidance, you will be able to find something that you should, you, you should, you'll be able to use as a point of reference. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, I'm going to go on to the next set of pre-submitted questions. And again, I'm going to um, invite Lisa and Alicia to respond. So the, the next theme really relates to practical and operational advice and support. And, and I know we've, we've covered that a bit, but I'm going to go into just read some of the next set of questions. So many community organisations are run completely by volunteers, such as village and community halls. As volunteers, there is a lot of responsibility placed on them regards putting all the correct COVID paperwork in place and making sure that this is adhered to. As a sector, we are in a position to support them with this, but how do we ensure that we are doing this efficiently and effectively within our current capacity. The next question was, if, is there a limit on numbers of people you can have at a CLD meeting? And where do we get clarification around safe numbers for groups and ages and households, adults, children, etc., and both indoors and outdoors? And the next question is, how do we strike the balance with restrictions on numbers for viable activities to continue? Do we try to encourage blended or more outside provision? So if we could have Lisa, then Alicia, and I don't know if Beth, if you want to perhaps add something to that as well. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so just on the, the question about how do um, practitioners and services support organisations to navigate their way through all of the different mitigations and the compliance with the regulations, um, I think just going back to the point that Alicia made earlier about the CLD guidance in, 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 the, in the first instance as a point of reference and about taking the time to really make yourself familiar with the guidance and forming yourself so that you've got the information that you need to be able to impart the right information to groups and organisations that you're supporting. And again, I would certainly be signposting people to the, the support and community safely resource because that is aimed at um, community groups and organisations in particular, and it's a resource that's there to help them to think about how they deliver their services in a safe way. Um, there certainly has been over the, the months since the start of the pandemic, um, different types of uh, training that's been put in place. Um, there are courses that have been delivered online that are designed and have been, have been there to support um, community-led organisations to, to think about how they're responding and to make sure that they are able to put operational procedures in, in place. And I don't know if maybe if Beth wanted to say something about um, the types of um, support that SCVO has provided. I know that you've got a very comprehensive programme of online training, for example, that's aimed at um, community organisations in particular. Sure. Do you want me to jump in just now, Lisa? Was that? Yeah, if that would work. Hi, everyone. My name's Beth. 
<laughs> um, I'll just jump in just on, on the back of what you're saying. So, so I work for SCVO, the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Um, and I think I'd probably just echo what Lisa was saying. I think th the main thing for me is that as much as possible, the infrastructure bodies like SCVO and SCDC and the others on the call today are trying to work in partnership. So there's loads of conversations going on behind the scenes between all of us and the TSIs and Volunteer Scotland and all of the other organisations that, that are there to try and support you to support your communities and support the organisations you're working with. Um, there are there's there's loads of training available. There's lots of webinars like this one today. There's lots of attempts to try and help people interpret the guidance or find which bit of guidance is the right one. Um, and I guess if if in amongst all of that you're still not finding what you need, I think I would just say get in touch. You know, get in touch with the organisation you feel most comfortable talking to. We've got a query service. The TSIs are all still active and operating. Um, and the more that we hear from people to say actually I can't find myself in this. I don't know where the answer to this is. The more we can talk amongst ourselves and say, right, is that something that needs to be added to support communities safely? Do we need to put that onto the Coronavirus Information Hub? Do Volunteer Scotland need to run a webinar about volunteers and safety? You know, it, it's those kind of conversations that we're having behind the scenes that are then in, informing what we're able to sort of provide publicly, I guess. Um, so, yeah, thanks, Lisa. Uh yeah, absolutely. And I think that probably maybe links um, and is, is relevant for a, um, a point that was that was made earlier, Kalei, about one of the questions that came in around, um, it, I think it was from a, a practitioner um, who was uh, supporting um, a couple of third sector um, groups, uh, community groups who weren't complying with the, guide, the, guideline, the guidance and the guidelines and about what they could do to get support in that situation. Um, I mean, from my perspective, from a Public Health Scotland perspective, it's no surprise that, you know, we view compliance with the mitigations, um, and that's about preventing the, the spread of infection as a deal breaker. <laughs> Essentially, you know, we know that COVID is driven by human contact, it's people gathering in spaces together, and the mitigations are there. Um, and should be in place and that's really the by having that that's only the, the only safe way that you can think about delivering um, services I mean I would have I would be keen to hear a bit more about that particular example to be honest um, you know if it's if you know if it's a group that are maybe struggling to understand what their responsibilities are around about compliance you know if they're not you know finding where they access the right information if they need a bit of help with training um, support and advice, then I think there's absolutely a role there for, you know, a CLD practitioner or a team or an, another third sector body to, to provide that support. Um, but what I would say is that in the interim, that the activity or service that they're actually providing has to stop. There has to be a pause there whilst there is, you know, a proper risk assessment about what they're doing and that they get the support that they need to put the planning in place to be able to deliver what they're doing uh, safely. I mean, I know Alicia, you had um, you had mentioned something um, in your presentation around about the kind of compliance and the responsibilities, particularly if it's public buildings and so on. Yeah, and I mean, just to echo what yourself, Lisa, and Beth have been saying, collaboration and all of this is key. Uh, it, it's key to speak to other people to make the best decisions for your group. I would say a couple of things um, in relation to responsibilities. So when the community centre guidance comes out, I, th I think it's important to highlight that the person who has responsibility for the premises has overall responsibility for ensuring the mitigations are enforced. And if you look at, in relation to the various pieces of guidance and navigating that can be incredibly difficult. Some of them give numbers, some don't give numbers and so on. There is a list at the end of the CLP guidance, which is probably never ending and certainly not an exhaustive list, but certainly the most relevant ones, I think, um, to link to different pieces of guidance, which again, get updated on a regular basis. Um, there is one line in the CLD guidance that I would draw everyone's attention to. And that line is that the guidance with the highest level of mitigation and protection for your group should be followed. So if my recommendation is that you find the piece of guidance that best meets your needs. However, if there's another piece of guidance that conflicts with, well, 
this guidance says that we don't have to do that, and this guidance says we, we should do that. You follow the guidance with the highest level of protection for the services that are taking place, is my recommendation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe just picking up on one of the other points that Colette had mentioned that came in as a question and was was about where where that applies when it's it's groups that are meeting in their own their own premises if they have a base and they're mm -hmm. using meeting rooms um you know for training purposes for meetings or you know maybe in the lower tier levels where they might be delivering some types of activity i mean again what i would say is is that you still have to have all those mitigations in place you know those are not dependent on the tiers that you're in even in those lower tier areas you do still have to have um systems in place to comply with you know test and protect um, measures you know that you still have to comply with the regulations around facial coverings you still have to have those physical distancing uh, measures in place you know you have to have hand hygiene you have to be adhering to really robust cleaning and disinfection um, measures and overall you have to have you know gone through a pretty rigorous uh, risk assessment process that really starts back with your original point Alicia which was about thinking very carefully about is this service essential at this time or can we continue to do it in an alternative way do we have the right capacity at this time to be able to do it safely and if that is the case are we really confident that we've taken every possible precaution to make sure that we're not in any way inadvertently adding to the spread of transmission um, in the community. And I think there was maybe a final question that was maybe a wee bit more practical around about where do you find information about specific numbers and the types of um, numbers for particular activities? And I know, uh, Alicia, you can maybe speak a wee bit to that because it is outlined in the CLD guidance. Um, so some of the activities are outlined within the CLD guidance that is with particular reference to um, education, training and avoidance of harm. So for these purposes, then there are there are numbers for youth work and there are numbers for adult learning. There is a lot of numbers within the unregulated children's services guidance too. So there's various pieces of guidance. And what I would say is if you didn't consider yourself youth work, on the 22nd of March, why would you consider yourself youth work on the 23rd of March once the restrictions come into place? Um, choose the piece of guidance that best suits, that best meets the needs of your activity. So if your group was operating in March and considered itself in one area, find a piece of guidance that's most suited to that and follow that guidance as strictly as you can. And there, there will be sort of um, other things that can add to that in a more practical sense uh, that go into more detail at a local level. So SEDC's um, safety guidance will be able to help with a lot of the practical elements. Um, I'm not sure if it's got numbers within it, but really when it comes to sort of baby and toddler groups and things like that, we really have to look at the different protection levels and what should reasonably take place and what's considered essential as we move up the different levels. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe just to make a final point on that as well, Alicia. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is completely dependent on a number of factors. It's about the tier that you're delivering in at that particular time. It's about the numbers of participants you've got in your particular service or activity. It's also crucially dependent on the space that you've got available, particularly for indoor activities, you know, you really have to be looking at the space versus the ratio of people to make sure that you can maintain the two metre distancing. Um, I've just noticed in the chat, there's a really excellent, really interesting point from Zoe um, saying that um, working with a group of vulnerable adults, finding it difficult to be compliant with the two metre distancing. Um, that they've got armbands that have got a, a sound, a beep on them um, to, to remind people if they get too close to each other. And I think that's that's absolutely fantastic. I'd be really keen to hear a bit more about that. Um, but yeah, I think just generally, if people are 
struggling to still find themselves within the guidance, then, you know, take the time, please, to look at it. Talk to colleagues, talk to peers, talk to managers to get their perspective. Talk to the community, I would say, as well, about, you know, where your service is actually being delivered and get their perspective on it as well. You know, look at other services that are similar to what you're doing and speak to them about how they've reached decisions about whether they are operating and how they're managing to do that safely. And just back to the, the point that Alicia made in her presentation is, is that if people, and Beth made it too, if, if people are struggling still with some of those decisions, please ask for help and advice. You can do that through the Support and Community Safely Resource. You can do that through SCBO and other third sector partners. But you can also contact your local health protection teams in your area um, if, that's, if that's something um, that you feel that you would want to do. Thanks very much, uh, Lisa, Alicia and Beth. Thanks very much for that. We're now going to go on to the next section, which is about supporting communities safely. We're going to have a PowerPoint uh, delivered by Mick from the Scottish Community Development Centre, along with Lisa from uh, Health Scotland. And just a wee reminder, uh, keep tweeting. Uh, I put on a tweet this morning, CEDAR Scotland, and I tagged in all of our organisations. So if you please want to keep tweeting and please keep uh, putting things in the, in the chat room, that would be great. Thank you so much. I'll pass you over to Mick and Lisa now. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So thanks very much for uh, um, you know being part of what is such an interesting conversation this morning. So what I we Lisa and I want to talk about a wee bit is supporting communities safely, which is a resource that's about I suppose interpreting some of the formal information we developed this early on in the process. It went up online in May and it's still developing. Um, but just to begin by having a wee bit of a think about where we are now. So we know, and we've heard already, that there's the, the law and the regulations that Alicia talked about. There was the route map, which for us, I think, became very significant at, at phase three, around about August, when things were you know, on the cards for opening up again. There's many, many different kinds of guidance. There's at least two sets, well, there are two sets of formal guidance targeting community settings. There's the CLD guidance, and there is guidance that's currently being produced around uh, community centres and should be available shortly. There's the strategic framework and the, it's the key overlay at the moment because it tells us what should be happening in the areas we're in at a given moment relative to the levels of infection and it's really important um, to be aware of how that affects everything else. Um, and in various ways these cover what, when and, and to some extent you know how to uh, deal with the issues associated with delivering services are opening back up. Supporting communities safely tries to do that by providing accessible information. And in particular, the next phase we're going to talk about, about today as well is around how we might balance risk. So just briefly thinking about what we know already, this quotes from the First Minister and the forward to the uh, framework. So as you can see there, she's been very clear that as we reopen things, however cautiously, we know that this does create opportunities for the virus to get a grip again. And I think it's fair to say that that's definitely happened. So lockdown worked, but reopening clearly increased transmission. Partly, I think, because quite a number of people sort of didn't follow the facts advice at the bottom. And partly because there are causes that we're still learning about. So it's important to um, be relatively firm with people who just refuse to follow the advice, but to be aware that, that, that being censorious with people is not always the way forward because there's some things about the, the spread that we don't know. However, this graph shows you right up till, you know, a few days ago, just how much we've seen the virus rise since we started to open things up again in August, since the kids went back, you know, universities went back, etc. And if we're, we're in any doubt about, you know, how that has panned out, that should illustrate what's happening. 
So we do know that what's driving community transmission, we know some things about it and there's some elements that are still disputed. And although there's no evidence currently, as far as we're aware, of any uh, community transmission arising from what community services are doing, there's no room for complacency. So with that, I'm just going to hand over to Elisa, who's going to talk about supporting communities safely um, as it stands at the moment. Thanks, Mick. Um, apologies, I'm actually just going to keep my camera off at the moment. I'm getting a little sign on my screen telling me that I've got pretty rubbish connection and I don't want to drop out. This tends to help if you, if you keep your camera off, so apologies for that. I'm sure nobody's going to be greeting about no seeing my face um, for the next few minutes. Um, so yeah, we just thought this would be a good point to actually maybe give people a bit of a walkthrough of the Support and Community Safely resource for people that are maybe not familiar with it or haven't looked at it um, yet. As Mick said, the resource um, is uh, co-produced by uh, Scottish Community Development Centre and Public Health Scotland. Um, and we, we, we published it first in early May. Um, although um, it's had a great deal of input in the development of it from other partners, including you know, Ready Scotland, SCVO, um, a Scottish Government um, and others. So, I mean, we were all aware in the very early days of the, in, in weeks of the pandemic that there was this huge, you know, phenomenal community-led response. Um, and a number of organisations had moved really quickly to try and respond to that and identify what the kind of issues um, were and what the sector needed to be able to continue that response. You know, ACDC did a survey, SCBO um, did a survey, um, a lot of the TSIs were speaking to their members to try and get a, an idea about what supports they, they were looking for to, to enable them to be able to continue with this. Um, now, this was before there was any formal guidance, really. There was, there was some guidance, but it was focused more on clinical settings and care type settings. There wasn't really very much around at that point that, that could have been used by community and third sector organisations, for example. Um, uh, there was, there, there, probably Glasgow Mutual Aid actually were probably one of the first um, groups that produced something that looked a bit like a toolkit that could potentially have been used by people who were delivering a response in their communities. But we were particularly keen to make sure that we were signposting people to and giving people advice that was really underpinned by that doing things safely message. Now, Health Protection Scotland is a part of Public Health Scotland, so we were in the position to be able to call upon our colleagues in health protection to make sure that we put together a resource that was very much underpinned by um, solid and endorsed infection control messaging. And that's the angle, that's the kind of underlying principle of the Support the Communities Safely resource. It's about supporting people to be safe and about how to deliver their services and activities safely. And it was very relevant in those early days around that emergency uh, response. It's been very well used. I think the last figures that I'd heard were that there was around about 20,000 had used the resource. Um, there's a contact us section and there's been a lot of engagement with groups and organisations. And wherever possible, we have tried to respond to some of the queries and questions either by you know, responding directly or trying to reflect that in the content as we've been updating it and we do that regularly as things change. Just want to skip on Mick if that's okay. Brilliant. So um, we we thought probably we'd just give you, a, you know, an idea of a couple of examples of how people might use the resource. And these are um, from examples of people that had got in touch with us through the contact us to tell us how they were actually using it. What I would say is if you've visited the resource pages recently, what you'll see is, is that we are actually in the middle of updating it right now. And as Mick said earlier, um, a lot of that is around about the planning and thinking about how we support people to restart services and Mick's going to pick up on that a little bit later but this is just a little bit of a whirlwind of the content of some of the resource if you are on looking at it so for example if you were providing an emergency uh, support to people who are self-isolating or had been shielding for example um, in section two of the resource there's a um, very comprehensive messaging around about um, things 
things like um, the changes to the route map, for example, and the changes to the local protection levels, being very up to date around about that, the easing of and the reintroduction of restrictions, the most uh, up to date information on the requirements around things like face coverings, um, and also information around about PPE. PPE is something that we got a lot of inquiries about in the early days, as I'm sure you can imagine, lots of community and organisations uh, were looking for advice about what types of PPE they should uh, be using and where to access that. So, um, um, as well as that, we would be signposting people to the section, for example, on store to door. So that gives really practical um, steps on things like how would you actually put in place a protocol for getting emergency resources, shopping, equipment, etc., to somebody who was self isolating at home putting in place those safe protocols, giving advice on physical distancing, hand hygiene, cleaning, disinfection. What would you do if you were sharing vehicles or having to, to, to tra travel with a, a volunteer or another staff member, for example? So it's, it's um, as well as encouraging you to reflect on whether or not you should be providing the service, it also is giving that more practical advice on how you might operationalise some of the guidance and use that to develop good, safe, policies and procedures. And just the next slide, Mick, if that's okay. So yeah, again, just another example, and this is something that we, we were hearing from people, you know, what do you do if somebody actually gets, gets COVID who's used your service or is working in your service? Um, we've got a very comprehensive section on the test and protect uh, measures. It sets out very clearly what contact tracing is, how it works, and it describes um, folks' responsibilities to comply with the test and protect system. It gives you some uh, practical advice about how to develop um, recording uh, systems for who's using your service and when, so that if you're contacted by an incident management team, you've got that information to hand and you can comply and support that. It also gives um, information and signposts you to where to get um, advice about your uh, GDPR requirements as well. Um, what we would also be saying in that situation is, is look at the other sections that are more about the prevention of infections. So again, very comprehensive information about physical distancing, putting in place measures, how you might actually physically do that in a base of premises by mapping it out, using signage, uh, using other resources to do that, and cleaning and disinfection, um, you know, what equipment and materials to use and a, a bit more about PPE, for example. So again, lots of practical and more kind of functional bits of, of information and advice. I'll just skip on again, Mick, if that's okay. Okay, so we know lots of organisations are continuing to provide an emergency food response of some kind, and there is obviously very specific and particular risks from an infection control perspective when it comes to um, food hygiene. So I'm not going to go into this in too detail, but if you are an organisation who's doing that, or if you're supporting a, a, an organisation or group who's doing that, we would be hoping that you would signpost them to section 11 of the resource. Um, it's got um, very practical resources. Uh, it's got a self-evaluation checklist where you can use that to really ask yourself, do you have the capacity? Do you have the ability to comply with what's required? There's a very, very good resource from Dumfries and Galloway um, environmental health team who produced a bespoke resource specifically for community organisations and groups who were providing an emergency food response and we signpost people to that as well. So that section is really, um, it's effectively a, you know, what to do but also what not to do if you're in that, in, in that situation and you're providing that type of support. And just the last slide, Mick. So as Mick said, he's going to pick up a, a, in just a second about section 13, but really just a kind of recap of the main pages and the content. And it's still very much relevant, although it was originally designed to respond to that emergency response that communities were involved in. It's particularly relevant, I think, as we go through to start thinking about how folk restart their core services. I mean, we feel, and as Mick said, that it offers groups an easy to read and very accessible Kind of summary of the key guidance and legislation. It does give those practical steps on how to develop good, safe policies and procedures. And all the way through, it is framed um, by you know, the government guidance and advice, the CLD guidance in particular, 
Um, and as that community centres guidance comes out and that adult learning guidance that Alicia mentioned earlier comes out, we will very much be including that in the pages and, re and referring people to, to that as well. So, I mean, overall, the objective continues to be to support people to make informed decisions and to think critically about if, how and when they're in a position to open or restart their core services. Um, and Mick's going to pick up on that now, so I'm just, I'm just going to hand back to you, Mick. OK, thanks very much, Lisa. Now, Lisa's dealt with the bits in a sense that are written and up there. Section 13 is the sort of least well developed because we started thinking about that some time ago. We are trying to respond to the rapidly changing sort of trajectory of the disease, the, the adjustments to the guidance, and in particular the fact we're waiting in the, we're waiting for the community centre guidance, but we are now moving to try and provide a bit of practical information that's similar, but it's worth remembering that a lot of the information in the earlier advice will be linking back to that because a lot of the advice about starting back safely is about cleaning, is about you know social distancing, and you know that is just as important for the restarting of ordinary services as it is for the development of uh, you know the emergency aid stuff that was been happening up to now and will continue to happen. We think through until certainly the earlier part of the year and after Christmas. So this was our first attempt at trying to bring together the big picture. As you'll see, it's almost unreadable on screen. So I'm just going to try and take you through it section to section. This is us showing our workings to a certain extent. And the idea is that the sections that we develop of, of practical guidance will link to practical resources. So for example, I was looking at a, a space calculator for helping folk calculate how many people should be in particular spaces. We're keen to look at the risk assessment templates that are available and see if there's any way we can do something pictorial around that, that might help groups that are a bit less used to using those kind of materials and also look for other materials that we can have translated into BSL um, and uh, give folk a bit of an easier way in. So we're suggesting that you could be planning at any point. So even if you're not restarting now, you can be using the time to plan. And that there are four stages to that. The first one being around the initial planning to avoid risk and thinking about you know, what's involved in that. And we're suggesting just some questions to groups and worker supporting groups around reading the relevant guidance, breaking down your work to its constituent parts, and thinking critically, if you do have vulnerable users, how might you support them? Because we're aware that, to a certain extent, many of you are working with vulnerable people. Unfortunately, in this particular context, there's a, there's a judgment to be made about how vulnerable they are. And I think we're suggesting if they're really vulnerable, they may be, in fact, so vulnerable, as Alicia suggests, that it would be a bad idea to bring them together and expose them to risk. Or if their vulnerability is not so much around COVID, it might be that they need individual support from other kinds of services. And then in the final analysis, if you do have to bring them together, then at least you know that you've really exhausted other possibilities around online or meeting people outside or other ways that are safe. Assessing the operational risk, I think, um, thinking about that under three categories. One is, what are the issues for the service users? So there's a very nice video clip in the SCBO site of Jason Leach talking about this. There is a, a set of guidance for thinking about assessing the needs of individuals. It's more designed for kind of clinical settings, but it worked for us too. What are the things that might make an individual folk or, 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 or groups of, within society that you're supporting vulnerable? Maybe their age, their health, their long-term conditions. What then are the issues arising from the space you're working in, in terms of the numbers of people that can use it, the use of face coverings, how people move around, and how they might use common spaces in multiple use places? And how do you record and reduce the risks kind of you know, arising from your activities? I think we are saying that even in small groups, it's a good idea to have a written record and have a written risk assessment, even if it's not strictly required by law, if you've got lower numbers of staff, for example. Um, but that should think about things like time spent together in proximity, whether there's a sharing of tools and resources. Re reducing risk during um, delivery is an important part of this. And we would suggest that ideally, is there somebody who can check your assessments? We would always, I think, recommend that if you're able to do that, using health protection and environmental health teams is a good idea. And we're also really interested to get feedback from any of you who tried to do that. Um, as well and how that's worked for you. Have you got all the resources that you need? You know, um, 
the SCVO website gives excellent guidance on where to access money for adaptions. There's, you know, there might be questions about whether it's enough, but there is money available. And other, also sometimes public agencies can help with this. And other also are the users and services doing their bit, both Alicia and um, Lisa mentioned this. You need your user group to comply with what you're doing, or you need to probably stop doing it, or at least have a discussion with folk about you know um, where that's happening. And also that extends to what else might be happening in the building. There's no point in making your own service COVID safe if the, if the group who used the building before you or in the next room are not acting safely, because that makes everybody vulnerable. And that's got to be another part of it. And we're hoping to provide some practical resources and how you might have those conversations. Critically, it's around monitoring, keeping how you keep people safe. So is the operational reality how you planned it? Apologies for the typo there, by the way. Um, it, a lot of it's around talking to your team and your users, and as I said, to other uh, building users and kind of using the questions that will help you to highlight the issues that you need to resolve in a systematic and robust way. And also keeping your eye open for any community transmission and stop if you see any signs that that's coming from you or, or, or any other um, local services and they need to monitor, not monitor in a clinical sense, but keep an eye on whether or not folk are, 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 are reporting that they're unwell and make sure that any outbreaks are reported to the appropriate folk. So the, the key kind of principles that we're hoping to build on are, are very similar to what's been said already, but we want to try and express these accessibly. So just because we can, doesn't mean we should. Balancing harm is really important. The four harms that I mentioned in the government material, but stopping transmission is critical. Getting it wrong can endanger life and disrupt services. That's a very stark message, but it is true, um, you know, in terms of our health service, but also the lives of the folk that we are trying to serve over a long period. It could also affect the governance liabilities of organisations. And for all of those reasons, we say it's important to think risk write it down, think about it, and talk to other folk. Challenge yourselves and think about what risks are worth taking, because clearly some of them are, but over the next few weeks and month, a month or so in particular, when so many organisations are in tier four, there are real questions you need to ask yourself about whether it's worth moving to greater uh, contact between people um, if you don't need to. And support and test and protect logging who's using services and when, because test and protect need that information to know what is happening. And share tips and experience with others, and we hope to provide mechanisms to help you do that. And finally, help, getting help assessing risks is really important, and there's going to be a Padlet, uh, which is a new term to me, by the way, uh, is going to be coming out in the wake of these sessions, uh, giving folk um, some help to assess risks and bringing a lot of materials together. Seeking funds for the essential uh, mitigations that you need and critically don't operate without it. Don't start operating while you're waiting for it. Um, and remember that people affect this, the safety of your system. So if folk won't or can't comply. I think there's a need to stop operating and talk to them, try and uh, persuade them to do so. But above all else, stay safe in the interim period. Change what isn't working quickly, and again, stop if needs be. If you try something and it's not working, don't keep going until you have another meeting to sort it out. We recommend stopping and uh, addressing that quickly. And if you have any doubts, call Health Protection Environmental Teams uh, to get health help with that process. So as I say, this is a work in progress. It's been presented in a fairly raw format. Uh, at the moment, but it will be tightened up and it will look more at the other supporting communities pages and be a bit more intuitive. Uh, and we hope that you'd find that uh, helpful. So I'll hand back to you, Colette, at that point. Thanks very much, uh, Mick and Lisa. Um, I hope you all found that really useful and informative and Obviously, throughout the morning, we're signposting you to different resources and tools that we hope will be really helpful for you and, and your teams. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Beth, who's going to tell us a little bit about the SCVO Coronavirus Hub and upcoming events. And then straight after that, we're going to take the next set of questions that were pre-submitted 
and focus on the theme of community engagement and communication. Okay, so over to you, Beth. Thank you. Great, thanks, Colette. Thanks very much, Mick and Lisa. Uh, Mick, you can probably stop sharing your screen now, if that's okay. And I can see everyone's lovely faces. Um, so uh, I won't take very long. I've just got a few minutes here, and I'm aware that you've all been listening for a long time. So um, you know, have a stretch if you need to stand up, do a wee spin around. Um, I uh, my substantive role at SEO for a long time was in the digital team. Um, so I think we're going to talk a wee bit about kind of digital skills, digital engagement, and um, in the questions that will come up. Um, but I guess one thing I was just going to say. So we we've been running the coronavirus information hub since the start of the pandemic as well. Um, Scottish government asked SEO to kind of coordinate the kind of core information that the voluntary sector would need um, as it became apparent that we were going to be entering uh, unprecedented times, uh, as is the kind of common phrase. So what we've tried to do with the information hub and I hope most of you have probably been on it for one reason or another um, but we've tried to provide really the breadth of information and signposting that the voluntary sector might need around the pandemic so we don't have anything like the depth of content that Mick and Lisa have just gone through and it wouldn't be there would be there'd be no point in us duplicating that and two of us doing the same same type of activity um, but what we've tried to do is to cover off the kind of core areas that are important for the for the sector uh, so I'll put links up once I finish talking but the main ones that you can find in the hub are funding information so all of the emergency Scottish government funds have kind of come through SCBO as one of the delivery partners. So if you haven't seen them or accessed them, um, the current Adapt and Thrive funding is all up there with all of the kind of the information. Uh, and there's a help desk and various other inquiry um, facilities associated with that. We've also got a kind of segment filtered from the Funding Scotland database. So we've pulled out all of the funds that are available for any organisation in Scotland that have a specific coronavirus element and you can search them and filter them. So again, not just the Scottish Government emergency funds, but all independent funders and grant funders that have got funding specifically associated with coronavirus. Uh, and you can find them on the hub as well. Um, there's information about digital, so both digital inclusion and digital service delivery. Uh, and one of my my uh, my pet things is we're talking a lot about restarting services, but actually for lots of us, we never stopped. So there might have been face-to-face -face emergency services, but lots of organisations have found new innovative ways of delivering support. Um, and a lot of that will continue even when we go back to being able to do stuff face-to-face. -face. Um, so just to sort of remember that, and also if you, you know, if you have been struggling with some of the digital service stuff, there's a wealth of information available about how to do that um, in effective ways and low cost tools and learning from other organisations that have responded as well. Um, other core information about kind of key governance things uh, and we're doing that in, in sort of combination with OSCAR. So, you know, safely doing your AGMs, what trustees need to think about in terms of their own personal responsibilities, you know, business continuity, all of that kind of thing. Um, and then also uh, basic information around sort of employment and HR. Um, and just a plug again, if people haven't come across it, SEVO has got funding from the lottery to provide an HR service specific to the coronavirus pandemic. So it was sort of recognising that as things like the furlough scheme we thought we were going to come to an end um, and as organisations are struggling with changing perhaps terms and conditions of staff, thinking about how to work flexibly, um, many smaller community organisations don't have a, you know, an independent HR uh, advisor. So there is now an HR service available free of charge at SCVO for all voluntary organisations in Scotland, both content digitally, but also an inquiry service. So again, you know, please make use of that if it's of benefit to you. Um, and then the last thing uh, just to mention is Connecting Scotland, which has been the Scottish Government's big rollout of connectivity and devices for people who are digitally excluded. And SCVO has been a key delivery partner for that. So again, there's, there's a lot of information about that available too. And the final thing to mention is we've been running, I think I said earlier, a series of webinars and different types of events in response to the needs we've been hearing about. Uh, and we did one with Jason Leach uh, in August, I think it was August or September, which was really well attended and got us loads of great um, pieces of advice that we were able to clip out and make available um, on our website and to other organisations. We're doing another one with Jason Leach on the 8th of September, sorry, the 8th of December. Um, I'll put the link in the chat box again, uh, but we'd love it if you want to speak to Jason Leach, have questions questions for him um, you know sign up for that come along it would be great to see many of you there as well and it'll be a very similar format to the session that we're on just now so I think that's me I'll pop links to all those things I've just mentioned in the chat box just now and they'll be on the padlet that will be sent out at the end as well so thank you very much thanks very much Beth um, we're now going to go on to the section on question and answers uh, relating to the theme predominantly of community engagement and communication 
So I'm going to read you out a few of the questions and then I'm going to bring in Susan Campbell from the Scottish Community Development Network and Beth and myself will maybe chip in at the end as well, depending how we're doing for time. Okay, so thinking of the digitally excluded, how can we engage people who need to access online resources and including those with whom we don't currently engage? With COVID-19 restrictions in place and most community centres closed, how do we engage with our most vulnerable communities? How do we ensure quality and consistency of engagement whilst also responding to ever-changing guidelines? And what practical ideas are there for engagement in the high level areas of restrictions? So Susan, do you want to come in please? You're muted, Susan. You're, You're muted. You're muted. That's Susan. me. Sorry, I couldn't get myself unmuted there. Apologies. Um, yeah, I, th I, I think, you know, quite a lot of what, what's been brought up in that has been, has been covered actually already, but it's, I mean, there's been such amazing and useful information shared just, just in, the, in, the, in the opening sessions, but I had looked at, around at some of the stuff that we've been looking at over the course of the time and this is a really, really tough time. I think that's what we all have to remember. It's a really difficult time and even just listening to what's been shared today, I, I, I can feel my own anxiety levels rising so I can't imagine what it's like being out in the field, you know, trying to, to manage this and, and just deal with it. So I think we need to acknowledge that as well, that this is really tough times for people and um, you're doing a, a really brilliant job, you know, from what I can hear from our network meetings, we're a Scottish Community Development Network is a members organisation and we've continued to have our members uh, regional network meetings online. Um, and the feedback that we're getting from practitioners is that engagement is hugely challenging at the moment and of course it is, how could it not be? Um, and there is there are huge issues around the digital divide. Um, some people are able to access online stuff, some people are not. There's a, a whole thing around training in terms of uh, getting people online as well. As Beth has just said, phase two of the Connecting Scotland funding programme has just opened this week. So, um, you know, that's something to definitely look into in terms of supporting the people that you're working with and practitioners and, and getting online because that's there specifically to support the most vulnerable people. Um, in terms of, you know, like connecting and engaging with people, <laughs> seldom heard voices, that was one of the things that was brought up. It's challenging to, to, to do this in normal times, never mind when we're in the middle of a pandemic. So I think you really have, we have to kind of accept our limitations just now and just do what we can. Absolutely keep trying to engage with people, but just accept that it's tough. It's really tough. Um, and working within the guidelines, I mean, we've spoke a lot about that. You've had a lot of information around how to work within the guidelines and how to, how to, to do that at the moment. And I think, there's a lot of very useful stuff already online around that. But it, feedback we're getting it is that it very much, it's, it depends on how the guidelines are interpreted within your local authority, and then how, you know, the protocols that are used with by, by your managers and just following those and seeking advice if you're not sure, um, which has been covered a lot. We've had a lot of feedback that virtual community centres are working really well. Um, in some areas, um, people are able to link in into different pages, different groups. I know that again, that depends if people are actually able to get online, but it's something to think about just in terms of how you can connect and keep keep things going, keep things moving. Um, really creative, some really creative stuff's going on out there. Um, and again, if people can share that among themselves, share that with each other, I think it could be really useful. Some courses have gone online, um, you know, in terms of I know that there's stuff around community engagement, there's stuff around the community empowerment, there's some participatory budgeting stuff that's online that I think is really useful that, again, you can look into. Um, but not everybody in the community is going to be able to access these things and not everybody's going to want to go online and in particularly in the high tier, higher tier areas, that is our only option just now by the sounds of it and by the looks of it. So it, really is I think about managing expectations and managing you know and looking at what we can and can't do just now and, and being clear with people. For some it may be that we can only do 
connect with them via email or phone calls or whatever that might be. And, and, and it's just about accept, accepting that, I think, at the moment. Um, in general, the feedback that we're getting from, our, from practitioners and our members is that people are struggling, that, that people in the communities are struggling and practitioners are struggling because they feel like they're not engaging well at the moment. But my experience from what I'm hearing from people is that you're absolutely doing your best and that you're, there is still a lot of engagement going on out there and that that's all that we can really do just now. So it's about being creative, it's about looking at what funding's out there and it's about also accepting the limitations because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And also, I think it's really about looking after yourself just now too, and really taking care of yourselves within all this. Colette. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Beth, have you anything that, to add there? Uh, no, I mean, I think Susan kind of covered it all. Just, just a couple of wee points I was just gonna say. One was, um, something about kind of confidence and assumptions so I, I think it, it it one of the things that we've heard quite so I've, at SEVO we've done digital inclusion support work for a really long time it's not just because of the pandemic and I guess the pandemic's kind of heightened and made us all more aware of how essential actually digital skills and connectivity is in the modern world um, and that you know that is something that that we need to all be aware of and focus on uh, as we kind of go forward uh, but not to not to assume that because people are in a particular community particular group you know maybe face other forms of disadvantage it necessarily means that they don't have access or that they don't have the confidence to use digital tools so um i think you know the, the sort of the basics of any kind of good engagement activity are you know you'll know your people speak to them find out what they're able to do because it, it might surprise you so i suppose that's just the other thing is, is that we sometimes hear because as staff you know we maybe don't have the confidence around doing some of this stuff or it hasn't been our usual ways of practice previously we might then make assumptions that aren't true for other people so just that kind of you know reminder to if you are in touch with people find out what they're comfortable using if they're good with whatsapp you know use the whatsapp if that's the thing that they're comfy with so there's again there's, there's loads of guidance and information about being digital champion the best way to do it um on on our website and in other sources as well but yeah i think susan covered off all the all the key bits and bobs can I just add something quickly to that? I, I, I think it's absolutely right what you're saying about not assuming that people can't do it because there's mm -hmm. two dynamics going on. One is that people are, are people can do more than you think sometimes, you know, and are, are using technology for other reasons. But another thing is more folk have been driven online, perhaps initially reluctantly, but they're on there. So we've been doing, as part of another bit of what we're doing, the Scottish Citizens Assembly, which moved online at the start, at the start of the pandemic. And it has been amazing how complex deliberative processes, they're not perfect, but they, they do work with a really wide range of folk from sort of 90 to 18 different abilities, folk with visual impairments. There's an awful lot can be done um, that we need to share the learning about. And in our Support the Communities programme, we are now working on community-led action planning initiatives online using maps and using we uh, programs like Jamboard, which is a, a virtual flip chart. If you haven't uh, used it, have a look at it. Um, and also, I think um, we'll be sharing that information at some point over the next few months on our supporting communities pages on the website. But I've been surprised because I'm a bit of a Luddite myself. And, you know, I have been surprised at what's possible and how helpful it is. And I do think Beth's right that for a lot of people will stay on board. However, it doesn't remove that final problem, which is, or that fundamental problem is, there are also, also a lot of people who can't, and that's something we need to really think about, how we enable that. Yeah, can I just jump in quickly, just on, on that as well? Um, both Alicia and I, and maybe others um, on the call, might have been on the adult learning webinar that was on yesterday afternoon. And I suppose it relates to, to sort of digital engagement, but it also relates back to the, what you were saying earlier, Kelly, about kind of community engagement in general. And what we heard um, on that call, particularly from folk that were coming from uh, public sector bodies and local authorities, was that, there's, that they have a challenge around about digital engagement as well, particularly with some of the platforms that they are and aren't allowed to use. Um, you know, we've all heard about the challenges around the MS Teams versus Zoom and who's using what um, and some of the restrictions around about that. So maybe for, 
folk that are that are that are on the call that are from local authorities. There's there's I think an absolutely a case to raise these issues within your organisations about the types of platforms that people in communities are actually using, and that you know making the case to 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 make sure that your own systems internally are as accessible as possible, and that you're able to use that to engage with people because um, certainly that's that's feedback that we've had. Um, and it was raised a number of times yesterday that it's been a significant challenge in moving some of the services online from um, organisations that are providing adult learning in particular from a local authority perspective. Yeah, th thanks very much, uh, Lisa, Mick, Beth and Susan Campbell there. And really just to reiterate all those points and in my experience in the Community Development Alliance, it's the whole balance between the, the practical and the creative solutions. And we've had, had an explosion of creativity. That's certainly the feedback that, that, that we've had from all our membership organisations. So we're going to go on to the next section now. And Really, the questions that you all submitted at registration, one of the themes that was coming through there was about the building forward better. So it's about taking stock of what we've all uh, listened to and learned this morning. And it's about thinking about the next steps uh, as we all move forward together collaboratively. Um, so I'm going to read you out a few questions and then I'm going to ask Alicia to come in first to respond to some of these questions. Um, so with additional funding provided by local authorities to allow them to maintain a COVID-19 safe CLD presence in local communities and assist uh, groups and halls to resume some form of activity, uh, Alicia's going to pick up on some of these moving forward points. What effect do you think COVID will have on our young people and their mental health? I think perhaps Beth and I will pick up on, the, on that point. Uh, how can we get access to more funds for new programmes to support learners who are seeking jobs after sudden changes in the economy? And how can we move on from this crisis? So, Alicia, please. Okay, well, again, there's a lot in that um, and a lot relating to funding. And you all be aware, um, Susan was speaking about funding in the SCBO website just, just there a few minutes ago. So there's a range of targeted programmes for young people. And I'm picking up on the one about the changes in the economy that you were talking about there just now. So Youth Work Guarantee has already been released. And this is something that ministers are looking at on a continuous basis. And the Scottish government is sort of gathering information on. From a CLD policy perspective, we are in the process of developing three strategies. And that is one for Youth Work, one for adult learning, and one for a programme for government just recently announced, which is going to take cognizance of the challenges that people have faced throughout the pandemic um, for a lifelong learning strategy to follow those two strategies that were paused back in March. So that, that will be moving forward. That will be from a policy context, what our focus will be. And a lot of that will be targeted at joining up a lot of the work that's already taking place and making sure that we're giving people the right support at the right level from the right service at the right time. Thanks, thanks, Alicia. Uh, Mick, have you anything you want to add to that? On the broader issue about how do we move forward for the crisis, I think mm. that uh, as a national organisation, we are party to many conversations about how we're going to move forward. And I think that that could range from very practical concerns that we need to address, like our colleagues talking about not being able to access Zoom. I mean, that surely in this day and age, that's something that we can resolve mm. forward because it doesn't make sense. And that's, 
that's been the platform of choice for the people, and we therefore have to find a way to respond to that. These are practical kind of instrumental learnings that we can get involved in. And there's loads of folk who are reflecting on the learning. I've been part of lots of conversations, but the people who are inappropriately or in, inadequately involved in that are communities themselves. So we have got a role and a responsibility, I think, to try and bring communities themselves into that debate going forward. And I think there's a positivity about the fact that we've seen how, as a nation, we can spend to protect and spend to save lives and spend to improve the quality of life that people have. And hopefully that in itself is a lesson that we will see going forward and make sure people are involved in that discussion. I think myself that I, 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 if, we, if we don't move forward within a kind of paradigm of communities being involved and having access to resources to help them become involved, then we haven't learned much from this experience. And to me, that's the major lesson around, and that partly is around investing in community learning and development. It's partly around the investment in the much wider community-led regeneration movement that doesn't see itself as being associated with community learning and development, but has many overlaps. And it's partly about how we renew the democracy. Uh, and these are all conversations that are going on with support from our own government. So this experience should be able to plug into that and boost it a bit. Now, granted, there's going to be an issue with money and there'll have to be discussions of the priorities. But I think what we can bring to that is trying to ensure that the full range of stakeholders are part of that process and that sharing that, that, that influence in those decisions. So, and I think that would be the main point I'm going to make, Colette, at the moment, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I would just agree, obviously, Mick, that we are doing a lot more collaborative working at a strategic level, at a national level, as well as regional and local level. So we're all going to work collaboratively to, as we move forward. I want to just touch upon that question that someone posed in relation to mental health for young people. Beth, I don't know if you want to maybe come in there or you want me to take that one. Uh, I'm happy to say a wee bit, but then I'll, I'll hand back over to you as well, Colette. So, I mean, I guess I would, you know, I would just sort of recognise the you know the question and the concern and I think we're all we're all worried about the impact that the crisis has had and is likely to have on young people um I suppose a few things that I'm aware of that are going on so there's there's the kind of the the issue around employability um so just now there's the the national funding for the kickstart scheme which is aimed at kind of getting young people you know into the workforce back into the workforce um and I think there will be a lot more focus on that and on kind of joining it up with you new know, existing employability schemes and and practice uh, across the country so there's something around that there, there's there's probably something for us and for our sector around sort of volunteering and and the way that young people have been perhaps involved in that slightly more during the pandemic than they might have been previously and how we capitalize on that and tell that story as well um and then obviously there's the actual support that young people will need for their mental health and you know, the services that exist to provide spaces for counselling, spaces for meditation, spaces for green exercise, all, all of those types of activities that we know can make such a difference. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there probably will be a lot of focus on the types of support that can help young people to not end up being really negatively impacted because um, they've obviously facing a lot more challenges perhaps than, than sort of the older generation with the impact on schooling and university and, and those kind of things. Thanks Beth and really just to add to that it's it's partly about the signposting to all of these expert organisations as well so for example a number of CDAS members have mental health as their particular focus so, for example, See Me, Mind, Youth Link Scotland, there's lots and lots of support and guidance out there and it's about homing in on the right organisations and tapping in. And that's why we are all working collaboratively because it is about signposting to the most appropriate uh, organisations for support for, for, for everyone. Yeah, so we have five minutes left. Um, have we any other themes coming through in the chat room, Susan, that we haven't touched upon? 
Uh, no, Colette, I'm not picking up any particular um, themes from questions. Uh, however, there is a specific question that someone's posed that, that wasn't done in advance. It was around, I suspect this will be for Alicia, if we have time, but it's really asking the question about how does the Scottish Government CLD guidance and framework link in with and communicate with uh, outdoor education sector, um, particularly as they're experts in safe practice outdoors. So uh, I think this is um, from Wendy Johnson and Wendy's been, as she's been trying to move uh, some activity and services outside, that's who she's consulted with. Um, so it's about how both those frameworks link up. That's a good idea. Um, obviously safety is a primary concern for most outdoor providers. In terms of youth work, there has been some outdoor education and sort of youth work provision collaboration, not so much for adult learning, um, but ultimately I would say that for providing guidance on safety, we tend to rely on people like Public Health Scotland, the HSE and um, DCMO, which is clinical advisors. So that's where the advice to go outside in the first place comes from. Uh, and that's what we would tend to follow in terms of creating any pieces of guidance. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> okay, thanks, Alicia. Hello, I see I see a couple of things popping up in the chat just yeah. last minute there. One around the, you know, I guess groups who might be operating in ways that are inappropriate. And I think I'd like to think we would all be trying to do what we normally do under circumstances there. Um, and I, you know, I think that there is a, a high, an, an increased vulnerability for people under uh, these circumstances, and you would expect um, high standards of behaviour there, if particularly if anything illegal happening. Um, so I think we'd be really interested to hear about those examples and see if we can give any reflections on them, and also share it with other folk. And also just in that final thing about the tier one guidance there. Um, I think one of the things I'm thinking would be helpful is to try and give some illustrations about how certain services might be affected in a range of tiers. And I think that's something we'd want to collaborate with Alicia on and other folk who are involved in this work, world and do something for supporting communities safely. That's a nice visual representation of what is possible and isn't possible. So we haven't done it, but I think we need to do it. And it's, it's from, tier, from tier one to tier four. Okay, th thanks, Mike. So uh, we're coming to the end of our webinar. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining us this morning. And we hope you find it's been helpful for you. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. So I'd really like to ask you to think about what's been most useful for you this morning. Has it been helpful? Um, where do we go from here? Would you like us to do another webinar, perhaps in January or February? So I'd like you to have a little think about that and maybe just pop in the chat room. Yes, no, what you liked. To, so just let us know, please, if you want to put a few things in the chat box. Just a reminder that we have recorded the session this morning, so we can always share the, the full recording. And we'll keep sharing links to different resources, tools and signposting to other organisations. So it's looking like a thumbs up for another webinar. <laughs>
Um, and as I said, we've all worked collaboratively together and we'll continue to do that with all of our organisations. So I'm going to finish by thanking Alicia from the Scottish Government. Thank you so much. Uh, Mick and Susan and of course the wonderful Sam who's done all the technology this morning from the Scottish Community Development Centre. Thank you so much. Uh, Susan Campbell from the Scottish Community Development Network. Thank you. Beth from SCVO and Lisa from Health Scotland. Thank you so much. Have I forgotten anyone? <laughs> So I was just going to say, Kelly, I think Alicia needs um, to get a virtual selection box for having attended four webinars in the space of one week. So well, well done, Alicia. <laughs> thank you, Colette, for sharing. Thank you for your hard work and sharing it today. Thanks, thank you Colette. so much. And for everyone who's taken the time out this morning to, to be with us, um, this is just the start of a process. So please, please keep in touch with any of us please contact us directly or have a look at the Twitter and Facebook so of, of any of our organisations. So thank you so much and have a great weekend. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, folks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hey, Pam. <laughs> Bye, Pam. <laughs>